hello and welcome to the next talk. Um, this is Lars Balthor. Uh, I'm very glad that he will give us this talk because uh, I think it's quite interesting to hear about how the NSA open source all the software there is. But at least that is a claim. Um, yes, and the question is how does somebody come to this? Uh, yes, Lars is uh, working. Um, in the IT security branch as a reverse engineer, so this is quite natural for him or this is something that he's doing or quite interested in. The talk is about uh, GISNA, or how I have pronounced, uh, an open source reverse engineer. <laughs> You, you take an object that has been produced, an artificial object, not by nature or something, but by man or woman. Um, and reversing this production process is generally called reverse engineering. You can think of any piece of hardware, any piece of software, and beyond, whatever that may mean. Uh, so reverse engineering includes both people opening up smartphones and soldiering, uh, unsoldering the stuff on it and understanding how it works and so on and so on. And reverse engineering has a goal. Um, it has, an, has, has the aim to, to understand the design and the architecture or in the most general sense to extract knowledge from the object, from the artificial object. Um, in this talk I will be focusing uh, myself on software, obviously. Uh, so I will only be talking about software reverse engineering, just to be clear. So the object that we study will be um, compiled binaries, mainly. Um, yeah. Uh, so binary software reverse engineering. Uh, so what is binary software reverse engineering? A lot of you people will already know that, but uh, I'm trying to be funny on the way so you will not get that bored and fall asleep or check Twitter all the time. So you normally start with something that you can read easily, for example, or easy-ish, for example, source code, and then there is a process going on that is called compiling, and then an executable comes out of it. 
And um, this executable depends on the architecture and so on and so on. So the compiler needs to generate the correct code for the target architecture and so on. And the process to reverse this compilation can be considered reverse engineering. So you start with an executable and you reverse the process of compiling into something source code or source code like. Um, I will phrase it a bit ge more general now. So you have something that is easy to read, then X happens, and then you end up with something that is harder to read. Source code is, of course, hard to read, but not as hard as binary, compiled binaries. And the reverse process is called reverse engineering. And I mean, this can be everything. I mean, you, you are, a lot of you are probably working in, in the software industry, so I guess um, maintaining a legacy software can also be considered reverse engineering. I mean, the software probably started with, as something that was easy to read, and then X happened. A lot of people don't know what. And now it's hard to read, and now you are uh, responsible to maintain it, and to fix bugs, and to implement new features. So even if, the, even if you have the source code, I would consider the process of understanding how to read source code as reverse engineering. So in some sense, you are all, or a lot of you are already reverse engineers. Welcome to the club. Um, now some motivation why one would even want to reverse binaries. Um, and this is a pretty long slide. So the first motivation may be quality assurance. So this is you buy a software and then you execute it and you want to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do, basically. So there are, it probably comes with some documentation or with a manual and so on, and it says this software does, I don't know, word processing. And then you want to make sure that it only does word processing and also that it does word processing in a good way and so on. And then reverse engineering is the process to understand this. Um, sounds like a lot of effort, but there are entities that want to make sure if they buy a software that the software doesn't do f fancy stuff or, as, or generally stuff that it's not supposed to do, like download something from the internet and execute it. So quality assurance. The next one is for educational purposes. So just for fun. This is, in my opinion, often uh, just an excuse to do some hacking. Um, another motivation to do reverse engineering is malware analysis. Uh, I mentioned this here not only, but also because I do this in my daily life. So my day job is to look at malware, which is often only present in the compiled format. So the malware authors not often open source their stuff. Sometimes they do, which is good, because then you have source code and can compare your binary to the source code and so on and so on. Um, and you might ask why one, why one even wants to uh, analyze malware. And the motivation behind this is you want to understand how they work, uh, how these hacker groups, the bad guys, work, and how you can defend yourself better against them, and so on and so on. Um, just, to re just to repeat myself, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or start talking, interrupt me, no worries. I can always talk over you because I have this microphone. Um, another motivation to do reverse engineering is exploit development. So you have a piece of software and you want to put something in, supply some input to the software so it behaves differently than it was supposed to behave. This is maybe a definition for exploit. Uh, what, is mean, what, what I mean with this is, there is software, and if you, I don't know, use letter A as a password, but supply it 1,000 times, then it crashes. And maybe if you not only use letter A, but other stuff, it starts to execute code that it shouldn't do, and so on and so on. This is uh, like first finding a vulnerability and then building an exploit for the vulnerability may be a motivation for reverse engineering. Another one is cracking, so how to circumvent software, copy protections, and so on. And the next one is economic espionage. So you have a software, and in the software there is a fancy algorithm you want to have because you also want to build the same software and implement the same algorithm and sell it for less money than the other company. Um, this may be a motivation. So I'm not a lawyer, but I tried to sort this list roughly by how legal I think it is to do this stuff with reverse engineering in Germany on a sunny day. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer at all. So I think <laughs> uh, 
Um, customer protection is pretty strong in Germany, so I guess quality assurance is always okay. You can do a lot of stuff for educational purposes in Germany, so this is probably also okay. Uh, malware analysis, I mean, maybe it's illegal to analyze malware, but on the other hand, I, I'm looking forward to being sued by one of them. <laughs> Come again, please. Maybe malware analysis is illegal. I'm not a lawyer. You, you're also not a lawyer, I know that. Um, exploit development. Um, uh, I, I recently met a guy at a conference, and he worked at a startup that do vulnerability research and exploit development. They were sued, and they settled, I think, but they were, it was not a, not a one case, I don't know. Cracking is probably, pretty sure, illegal in Germany. And uh, stealing of intellectual property and then making money out of it is also illegal, I guess. I'm pretty sure. So this is the motivation. And I included this slide so um, you know that there are legitimate use cases for reverse engineering and also illegitimate use cases for reverse engineering. So the power I supply you, you know, with great power. Another good motivation, um, I will repeat the question, thank you. <laughs> the question or comment was another, moti there, there are a bunch of more motivations, I'm just trying to distill it down. Another motivation is if you have a closed source component and you want to interact with it, I don't know, maybe an API server or some low level stuff, and there is no documentation around and the developer of this part, software part, left the company or got hit by a bus or something, um, and you still want to interact with this piece of software, you may be forced to do reverse engineering to understand it and interact with it. This is probably pretty up high on the list. This is probably super, super legal in Germany. OK, yeah, you, you are a lot of people. And sometimes if you do this, it looks like you are raising your hand. And I'm not sure. So uh, how do I even do it? Uh, I will now make an example. So. Um, if you know C, this is probably not a problem at all. If you don't know C, I will just give you a quick run through. This is the most basic C program you can come up with. First, you make sure that you can do input and output. This is the first line, include stdio.h. Then you define the main function. This will be the entry point of execution. The word entry point will repeat itself later in this, in this talk. Um, so this is basically the point where execution starts after you compiled it and then ran it on your system. Then it uses printf, which is a function to print something on the, on the screen. And here I just print a constant string, hello froscon, uh, which is German for hello froscon. Um, <laughs> I could have translated this, but... Um, uh, and then it, uh, it um, contains a statement, return zero. And this will also be important later on during this talk. Um, this is the so-called return code of the program, and it signals back to the operating system that everything went well. So um, the return code of a prog program is interpreted as an error code. So if there is no error, the, um, we just all agreed on this is represented by zero. <clears throat> so then we compile it, as I said in the very beginning. You can, for example, use GCC for it or I think I used min gw. There is Microsoft Visual Studio. There are a lot of compilers around. Um, you probably know, much, probably know much more about compilers than I do and how they are built and so on. And to make it a bit harder for the reverse engineer, you can call strip on the, reverse, on the uh, resulting binary. This makes sure that um, there are no function names in the binary anymore. So, if you just compile it without any flags and without any optimization and so on, then um, it, it will still be possible to see how you named the different functions. In this program, it's super boring because it only had one function and, it call, and it's called main, but reversing of a program gets harder if there are more functions. And um, if you also don't have the names, then it's even harder. So, demo time. <laughs> So we will start with something um, that, is, that can be called dynamic reverse engineering or dynamic analysis. For this, I will start a VM, which started on a different screen. So let's 
close this. I have a presentation window, which is larger. Hello. So there's a program called hwelt.exe, which is German for hworld.exe. <laughs> and I will execute it, and it prints Hallo Frostcon on the screen. So this was the most basic way to do some dynamic software analysis. I, ex I executed the program and observed what it printed on the screen. It may have done a lot of other things in the background, and this is already a downside of dynamic reverse engineering. It may do stuff, and it may be doing it in such a sneaky way that you cannot notice it like this. I mean, you can start like process monitoring and API hooking and so on and so on, but uh, generally dynamic reverse engineering is very fast, but also has its limitations. Mainly, uh, there may be, um, I don't know, functionality hidden in the software that is only triggered at night, or that is only triggered if the number of seconds since midnight is divisible by six or something, whatever. So, um, so there is another thing that is called static, uh, static software analysis, and this is... Um, if you don't execute the software itself, but instead use tools to analyze it. And the first tool you may use to start your reverse engineering career, career is, the call, is the tool called Strings, um, which just looks for printable characters in the executable and prints them on the screen. So I will call this on, uh, on the exe and then pipe it into less, uh, which makes sure that because there will be a lot of stuff, and I only want to view it page by page. And then stuff happens. So you see all the printable stuff in the executable. The first line may already spring to your eye. It's, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, and I will explain later what it means and so on. Um, but let's just scroll down the list. There's a lot of printable stuff that there's our two probably nothing interesting, and then I scroll on and on, and here stuff happens, for example, Hallo Frostcon. I totally expected this string, because it was printed on the screen, it better be in the, in the binary. There is also some stuff about GNU, and there is also, do you see my cursor? Yeah, there is also min gw minus w64, so this may be an indicator that something happened here, then I scroll down, and more stuff, and more stuff, anyway, anyway, anyway. Let's switch back to the presentation. So what did we learn from this static reverse engineering, most basic static reverse engineering part? I will, it will get better soon, so don't, I will not only do string-based reverse engineering, but just as an example. So this program cannot be run in DOS mode. This is um, an indicator that this is probably a Windows executable we are dealing with, and this is because something very, I think, very remarkable Every single Windows executable you have on your system is backwards compatible to DOS. So you can execute it in DOS, and it will run. It will not crash. I mean, I don't know. I forgot how old DOS is, but it's, I think it's pretty amazing that they work. It will not do the same thing. So if you, I don't know, if you, what's, what's a recent computer game? Is Overwatch still a thing? No. Anyway, I will take Overwatch as an example. If you, if you execute overwatch.exe on your DOS box, it will not run Overwatch. But it will just print the string, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, on the screen and terminate gracefully. So it's compatible, it does a different thing. So when this string is present, it's an indicator for um, that the thing we are looking at, the target of our reverse engineering, is a Windows executable. The other one was Hello Frostcon, so I think it may be a Hello World style program. Maybe it's doing more, maybe not. I don't know yet. And I also saw this string, which suggests that it was compiled with a certain compiler. So we all already extracted three pieces of knowledge from this binary, and you see it on, on, on the projector. Uh, so this can be considered the most basic, par basic form of reverse engineering. You may notice that there are a lot of probabilities and suggests and so on, in the sentences above. This is because there is always a time constraint. Uh, first of all, you only have 24 hours a day and you probably want to sleep. And um, you hate to break it to you, but you will probably die at some point. So there is a, a very tense time constraint on how much time you can spend reverse engineering. So it will always be, um, be 
like a balance you have to find between how much time you want to spend reverse engineering and how confident you are in your assessments you're making. So I only spend 30 seconds or something, so I'm pretty fine with the confidence levels I, I could have I, I extracted from it. Uh, what questions do you have at this point? René, maybe you? No, no questions? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so this was, the talk is over. I already covered all of this. No, just, just making fun. Um, the next five sections of the talk will be a quick comparison between static and, reverse, and dynamic reverse engineering. Then I will talk a bit about executable formats and what formats I will, I'm interested in and so on. Then I will give a very quick primer on assembly. And, but the, the awesome part is that you don't have to know assembly anymore to be a reverse engineer. You should learn it to become a good reverse engineer, but um, it's not the first thing you need to do, which in my opinion is, is good. Then I will talk a bit about tools and what the tool landscape changed, or how the NSA changed the tool landscape. And then uh, I will talk about Ghidra. So, I hope you're not that uh, annoyed that Ghidra is very at the, at the bottom of the list, but as I said, I wanted to give some context. So static versus dynamic reverse engineering. Here are two super boring um, definitions. We will just read them. Dynamic software reverse engineering is the analysis of computer software that is performed by executing programs on a real or virtual processor. And static software reverse engineering is the analysis of computer software that is performed without actually executing the target program. So this is what we just did. I first started a VM with Windows in it, and then I executed the program and observed what it did. And then I called strings on the program, which doesn't execute the program at all. And um, I read the output of the helper program, which is strings. Um, and there are a lot of upsides and downsides. I, I also have a slide on the upsides and downsides at the very end of the presentation. So if we want to go into detail then and have time, I can do that. Um, but the TLDR uh, is that dynamic analysis is not foolproof. The program can, be different, it can behave differently. Um, it's super fast because you'll get instant results and it's not that boring. And static reverse engineering, maybe the TLDR is uh, you can be more confident that you understood all the software, or all the, all the features the software has. And, um, but it's also not foolproof. I mean, you can always spend more time, and maybe you missed something, and maybe the tools you use to analyze the software are not uh, are broken or are not working well, and so on, and so on. So, executable formats. Um, what I mean with this is, if you have an executable on your machine, you can execute it. We just observed this. I called hvelt.exe, and it puts something on the screen. Um, and the... These executables have a very specific format. Um, it totally depends on the operating system, so Linux uses ELF files mainly. There are, oh, of course, there are um, Windows-based systems that use the PE format. I will talk about this in a moment. And there are a lot of other systems with all kinds of formats, and I'm not an expert in them, so I will not waste your time if I try to explain stuff that I don't know very well. But they are always expert for everything. There was a, yeah. So there are different systems. ARM is another big, big candidate. Um, yeah, we will focus on Windows here. Um, and it uses the so-called portable executable format, or PE, um, which is obviously funny because uh, Windows executables are not that portable. I mean, they are portable, but only from one Windows version to the next, which is already pretty amazing, but uh, they are not portable to Linux, except for now there's Wine, and yeah, anyway. Uh, this is probably nothing I have to explain a lot in this, for this audience. Um, but what techniques we use to do reverse engineering on these different um, executable formats is um, heavily dependent on how they were produced. Were they written in C? Were they written in C++? Were they written in Delphi? Were, were they written in Go and compiled to window, with the Windows target? Were they written in .NET and so on and so on? Um, for example, C programs are normally the easiest to reverse engineer. This is, I think, because um, they, the tools are so good in doing this. C++ is 
normally more a pain, but on the other hand, even reading C++ source code may be more complex than reading plain C source code. Delphi is a mess. It produces so many functions, and it has so much indirection. So everything in Delphi is an event, and it triggers other things, and so on. Uh, I'm no expert in Go, but if you want to do Go, talk to the red guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, .NET is quite easy. I heard that, right? <laughs> so the the question and the answer, which both I wasn't involved in, were Delphi is pretty easy to reverse because there is a good disassembler. I will explain all these words in a moment. And he was like, malware is harder to reverse. Did I cover your points accurately? Okay. Um, .NET is super easy. There are tools that where you can just dra drag and drop the, the binary into, and then you have the source code again. So if, if you develop .NET software and you want to protect your source code, then you should use obfuscators. I don't think that I should have said that, but just don't protect your source code. Just open source everything, right? This is an open source conference? Nice. <laughs> Uh, and now, but now I will talk on native PE files. With this, I mean no.NET binaries. And uh, we will start with normal native PE binaries. So no Delphi, for, at least for starters, uh, and also no Go. Um, so PE files, they are made up of so-called sections. So there are different sections in a PE file, and you can really imagine it as there is a header, and then there are one section, another section, another section, another section, and then at the very end is something that is called overlay, which is just appended to the executable itself. And um, these sections, there can be a lot of sections, and they have names, and they are called, for example, .text, .data, .rdata, .bullshit, shit, or .bss. Um, so who wants to guess where the, where the program resides the actual program in the text section yeah there is no text in the te or there's not much text in the text section the text is in the r data section so hello frostcon will be in r data this means read only data which also makes sense but this is always surprising that the program is called text i think i think it's because of these old computers oh i don't even know what lochkarte means in english punch card or for these old computers with punch cards, and I don't know why, but they called these things on the punch card text or something. If, if some of you know why it's called the text section, speak now or be silent forever. <laughs> <clears throat> so and then there is a, a program, or there are actually a few programs, that interact with the low-level Windows API to... Um, to load an executable into memory. They are normally called PE loaders, and they're not doing fancy stuff. They just pull out the sections from the executable and place it in, in a virtual memory space. So um, yeah, I will not go into detail there. They just place it into the virtual memory space. The PE can say, I would like to have this section somewhere here in memory, and I would like to have this section somewhere here in memory, and so on and so on. The PE loader can also take care of something called relocation, where you can place it somewhere else, where it places the sections in a different spot in memory, and then it passes execution to the .text sections where the actual program is. So this happens if you double-click something. All that, what I just said, happens in a Windows machine. Um, Oh, I just said that. Cool. So what is in the text section? In the text section, there is assembly. And um, I see that we are, uh, are fast-ish in this presentation. So maybe I will go into more detail later. If you don't know assembly, I will try to summarize it for you in five minutes. This will definitely suck. So if you know assembly, don't judge me for the next five minutes. Um, it's a low-level language. You can consider it a programming language because you can program a computer with it. And it's executed by the central processing unit of your machine, by your CPU. Um, I say low level because um, for assembly developers, C is a high level language. Uh, 
I mean, for, I don't know, JavaScript developers, C is a low-level language. It always depends on the perspective, right? Uh, it only, assembly is only able to do very basic things. Um, it's also able to do some more complex things, but it's definitely not able to play Iron Man the movie or something. Yeah? It, it, it is only able to do stuff like, here's your memory, copy something from this part of memory into a register. Copy something from this register to this part in memory. Here, there is a five, please double the number. Or this part in memory, add three, or stuff like that. Um, and this is pretty remarkable. I, I mean, these are the only things a normal uh, x86 CPU can execute, and a few more. Um, and we still have all this software. This is, I think, it always blows my mind whenever I think about it. And, I mean, people, and we have these compiler things. They are magic programs that turn C source code, which is super readable, in my opinion, into these low-level thingies. And then, if you think about it, at some point there was no compiler. So, you cannot write a compiler in C without a compiler for C. So, the first compilers were actually built in assembly language. Okay. You are not that excited about this as, as I'm awesome. Woo! <clears throat> there are a few very central concepts when it comes to assembly language. Um, registers, stack, and functions. <laughs> there are a lot more, but I will focus on these three for now. Um, registers are part of your CPU, so it's very small memory components in your computer that can store data. Uh, but the upside of them is they are super fast. They are even super fast compared to your random access memory, to your RAM, which is normally considered the fast one compared to hard disks. Always point of perspective, right? Um, and they are used for stuff I just, uh, that I just described. So load something from this part of memory into this register. Double what is in this register. Take something from this register and this register, add it together and store it in the first one. And so on and so on. And with, yeah. And the last thing are functions. You probably know, if you, if you ever developed software, you probably, you should definitely know about functions. <laughs> um, they are parts of your program and Oftentimes, not always, if you write a function, a compiler will turn it into an assembly function, to something where you, that you can call and that will return in the end. Of course, compilers are also doing optimization things, so they may remove a function and inline it, or they may create functions, and they, they may do all, all kinds of things. Um, so, assembly is often shown in the disassembled state, so instead of, oh yeah, this is, oh, I, I have to talk about hex encoding. So in, as, you, as the computer science teacher at your school probably told you, in your computer there are only ones and zeros. And um, this, is your rep this me basically means you can represent data as ones and zeros, which are represented at the lowest level by there is current applied or there is no current applied. Um, and if you look at it mathematically, a sequence of ones and zeros can be, is a number. It's not encoded in decimal format, but in binary format. And this is a representation in hexadecimal format. So there are digits in it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. And uh, the next few digits are A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, but still, this is not very readable. I mean, if you just have tons of these hex numbers on your screen, you cannot deduce a lot of them. So there were disassemblers invented, and I heard there is a very good disassembler for Delphi. Um, and these disassemblers turn these sequences of, of data into something like this, which is considered to be more readable. Uh, and what this command does, this is, in, this is a so-called Intel notation for assembly language. Uh, which I prefer, I don't know why, because it's harder to read, because you have to read it from, from, from left and then from right to left. So you first look at the very first part that is called sub. This is a mnemonic. I don't know why they call it that, but it's called mnemonic. And the mnemonic... Mnemonic. 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 
mnemonic. The M is silent. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce Johnny Mnemonic. Anyway, the question was, how do you pronounce Johnny Mnemonic? And it's pronounced Johnny Mnemonic. Mnemonic, mnemonic, mnemonic. The mnemonic here is sub, which means subtract something. And what from what is the following? There are two arguments now, RSP and the number OX98. And now you have to read it from ref right to left, if it's an Intel notation. And RSP is one of these registers I talked about. So what this assembly instruction does is it sub subtracts OX98 from the register RSP and stores it back into RSP. So you just learned your first instruction in assembly language. Oh, you already knew that. I didn't uh, want to mock you. Um, and there are the mnemonics. There are like a few hundreds or a few thousands, depends on how you count. And um, I don't know them all by heart. Actually, I, I often have to look up the most basic ones, especially if I want to understand some edge case behavior of them and so on. But there is a large documentation, the Intel assembly documentation. It's a light read for a sunny evening, only two or 300 pages of mnemonics, description, what it does, what is allowed, what is not allowed, and so on and so on. I can definitely do recommend that one. Not. Uh, let's talk about tools. Mm. So at the dawn of time, there was only one tool for reverse engineering. No, that's, that's not right. I don't know. Uh, there also was IDA. Uh, there always was IDA, which is a short form for interactive disassembler. I didn't get, catch that. Source. 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 Like a sorcerer, but okay. There, was, there were a lot of tools before that. But I'm young. <laughs> I, I'm not young anymore, I know. <laughs> so I didn't know. Or at least I'm, I'm young in the industry. So, um, and there always was IDA. Um, and it was a tool, or it still is a tool, to, trans to do this translation step I just showed you. The step from 4881EC980002 sub RSP OX98. This is called disassembly. And um, it showed you the resulting code. It also did some syntax highlighting and helped you with that. But then at some point, they decided to do something pretty amazing. And this was creating the hex rays decompiler. And it just does what, it, what its name suggests. It takes assembly commands and translates them back into C-like code, or pseudocode generally. Um, it of course, it can only do so much. It, uh, for example, function names may be lost, variable, variables are lost, but it tries to reconstruct them, and it does all kinds of things um, to do that. This is also the reason this software was super, or still is super expensive. So the existence of this software basically divided the reverse engineering communities in two classes. The one that can afford IDA, I, I think it was around $6,000 a year or something, and they one that cannot. I mean, for a company, that's probably not that much money. On the other hand, if you, if you want to employ 10 reverse engineers, then it's 60,000 and so on. Um, and there were people that were not able to pay these kinds of, this kind of money. Um, then there are other tools like Binary Ninja. I personally didn't use it, but I heard from people, it's good. And then they stopped using it and got, went back to IDA. Uh, on the other hand, Binary Ninja is Cheaper, it only costs a few hundred bucks. Uh, then there is Red Deck, which is very um, promising. It's an open source effort, and the, it's, it's short form for retargetable decompiler. And they have a very, um, they have a pretty awesome goal. They not only want to produce pseudocode, but they want to produce real code that, that, that then can be recompiled. So there was this question with the closed binary blobs and the source code is gone and so on. They want to produce source code from it and this source code can then be compiled again, which is pretty amazing because this means there is no, um, no architecture problems anymore. If you have a binary, you can recompile it for another system and you have a binary for the other system. So that's cool. But um, in daily life, it doesn't work well for me. I mean, you 
drop something in and then it produces code that is hard to read and so on. And then uh, the NSA came around and open sourced Ghidra. Now we are oh, nearly through in the presentation. I only have 20 minutes left. You will start raising signs in a moment. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. You have five minutes to raise the first sign. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and open source the tool called Ghidra. And now I will talk about Ghidra a bit. Uh, there were these Vault 7 leaks like two years ago. Uh, I already forgot who leaked, but I think someone broke into the CIA and stole data. And from this data, you could deduce that the NSA created the software that is called Ghidra and that is used for reverse engineering. Um, this software was somehow classified, so the source code wasn't public, and even the existence was a secret, so it only leaked through the Vault 7 leaks and so on. But since then, we know that we knew that this software exists. And um, then, very surprising to me, two years later, the NSA decided at a security conference, we will release it into open source. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that was unexpected. And then um, they really did that a few months later. I mean, it's a government agency after all. So a few months later, they um, released it into open source. Uh, Ghidra is made up of two components. There is, come again, please. Oh, there was no question, sorry. Um, it consists of a Java-based graphical user interface and a backend written in C. And it's all compiled for all platforms. So Ghidra is open source and cross-platform, which is also very surprising to me. So you can use Ghidra on Windows, Linux, and macOS and reverse programs for all the other platforms. Um, and uh, it's capable of, wait for it, decompiling native PE files. So it also produces C-like source code, and you can look at it. And that, what it does then is, um, oh, it also supports a lot of other formats, um, like all kinds of formats. It also has, a, has an interface to specify your own format, and then it tries to decompile it based on that. There was, for example, uh, a guy that wrote... Um, wrote configuration files for the Sega Mega Drive card writes, and then you can put the ROMs from these card writes into Ghidra, and it decompiles it to C code. Super amazing, to be honest. So I, I'm not an NSA fanboy, but um, I think this was good. You, you can speculate why they did it. Okay. Oh, you have a question, René, finally. I will repeat the question because the microphone is switched off. The last one? Um, it's also, also capable to decompile Yes. DLLs. Yes. Um, are DLLs PE files? DLLs are PE files. Okay. That's correct. Um, or DLLs means dynamic link library. It's the way of Windows to put library code that can be used by multiple applications. And uh, Ghidra can even more. It can just generically decompile assembly. So if you have... If you have shell code, for example, it can decompile it. If you have library code, it can decompile it, and so on and so on. Sometimes, thank you very much, 15 minutes. <clears throat> so, uh, we will, in a moment, the next demo is coming up. So, uh, we will import an executable, the Hello World program from the beginning. Um, then we will be able to um, decompile the assembly, look at the pseudocode, and then, it also tries to guess some variable names because sometimes even if there are, uh, for example, if a, if a variable is initialized with zero and then used in the condition of a loop and in every loop iteration it's increased by one, it may name it i, for example, stuff like this. I, I think this concrete example is wrong, so it doesn't name it i, but it could, yeah. And it's open source, so you can contribute and make it, name it I. Uh, and then uh, it, does, uh, it allows you to refactor the resulting code. For a real developer, the refactoring capabilities are very limited, so you cannot inline functions or extract functions and so on, but you can rename functions and rename variables and so on and so on. So I think now is demo time again. <laughs> so 
if you start Ghidra, it looks like this. Uh, or you first have to create a project. And it, it's very Java, so there are a lot of dialogues where you have to click. And, but it, it, it's really usable. So you first have to create a project. I called it FrostCon. And um, now I will take the HVELT program from the beginning and drag and drop it into Ghidra. Are you ready? So then it says, yeah, this is a portable executable. It gives you some information. I normally don't read it. Just click OK. Then it displays more information. Don't read it. Just click OK. Um, <laughs> now you have the HVELT program in Ghidra. And now you drag and drop it onto the dragon. <laughs> Be prepared for something. <laughs> something at, uh, someone at RSA programmed this. I mean, there was like, we have to do this dragon animation. <laughs> And then other people were like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> then it asks you again, do you want to analyze this? And then you say yes. And then it all shows up on the wrong screen, but I will just throw it over. And then it says, analyze again. And then this window opens. Oh, then it says, then it's displaying warning, which means we are done. And then, <laughs> um, so I increase the font size for this presentation. Normally, you can read more than just something. And now, there is stuff happening. So this segment on the left will display assembly commands. And if I scroll down, you will see some of them. So here is the address in virtual memory space. Here are the, um, the not dis disassembled. Uh, here's the not disassembled data. Then there comes the mnemonic and the interpretation that happens then. For example, I don't know, E8, I, I knew that is a call, which is translated into a call. And then here comes a memory address, which seems to hold a function that Ghidra decided to name strudel length. Oh, and sometimes these pop-ups open up. So, um, and then uh, on the right-hand side, it already displays some source code. I mean, it's Hard to read source code, but especially if you're in software development, you may have read worse. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Mm -hmm. OK, I just closed it by accident. Sorry for that. Mm -hmm. I have to start it again. We'll take a moment, sorry. Nice oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, oh, it's crashed. It's open source. You should fix it. <laughs> this is an open source conference, right? So, and now there are two approaches to try to reverse engineer this program. There is like a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach. So bottom-up would be a look at the exports of this function, figure out where the entry point is. And top-down would be, I know that there is a fr the string hello frostcon in this binary, and we will find the string in the binary and see where it's referenced and then find the function where it exists. What do you want to do first? Oh, that was a surprising question. Do you want to do top down or bottom up first? I will bottom up, bottom up? OK. So I will start with um, the exports. I, I didn't increase the font size here, but you can um, trust me. There is an export directory. It only has one uh, export that is called entry. And now comes uh, something that you only get used to. So I can give you so much knowledge, but uh, you only get used to the fact that there are two functions in some binaries, and you have to look at the second one, OK? <laughs> this is like a preamble in a lot of PE files. And then there is a lot of code, but from looking at it, if you are an experienced reverse engineer, you know this is just setup code that does like command line parsing and so on and so on. And at the very end, there is a return. And by the way, it is, it is an IDE. So if you click this variable, it will highlight all the other occurrences of this variable. So it returns this variable. And you remember when I said um, we are interested, there is a, something like that is called return code. So this is the return code of the program. So I'm to find the actual entry point of the executable. I'm interested in the function where this uvar8 variable comes from. I can also rename it. Um, oh, this is broken. but. There's 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Return code. Um, 
and there is a return code, and I, I notice it comes from this function. So I double click this function to go into it, and there we are. There is the put as hello frostcon. Something interesting, by the way, I used the, F, the uh, printf function, but the compiler decided, hey, this guy doesn't know what printf does. It does formatted output. You can also use put as, which just puts out a constant string, and it replaced it. Yeah? Go compilers. Uh, there is also this function here. There was a question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was a lot of questions, and uh, I don't have time to go into detail right now uh, to to this one. Sorry. Uh, this function here at the beginning, uh, if you look at it, you may think of oh, something funky is going on. But again, if you're more, if you gather some experience, you may realize this is nothing fancy. This is something called. This is something connected to so-called stack cookies. So there is a protection mechanism where you put something on the stack that I talked about, and then you ch later check that it's still there. So this is just a stack cookie function. Um, I still have s a few minutes left. So uh, do you want to see a, more, a bit more complex program, or do you want to ask questions? Complex. OK, got that. Um, so then we will uh, first execute it because everyone loves dynamic analysis. So hvelt2.exe. This program accepts, accepts some input. So I don't know, I put in a number, and then it puts something out. Maybe I do it a bit more systematically. One, two, three. So if you put in one, it outputs one. If you put in two, it outputs five, three, 14. Already have an idea what's happening? You, you shouldn't have, but you can, I don't know. The suggestion was it's one squ OK, the, the suggestion was drawn back. But we don't have to guess. We can just reverse engineer it, OK? So I open it up. And then I close this one. Yeah, save it. I did so much work. And then I drag and drop hvelt2 into the executable. Now I can show you the. Uh, bottom-up approach, and just look for the string Eingabe, which is input in German. And first of all, we, have to, we can enjoy this one again. I will search for the string Eingabe, see where it's referenced. This is the part where this is where all the fun stuff happens. So let's go to search for string. Then it displays another useful dialog, which I will just confirm. Then these are all the strings in the binary. Well, we already knew them. Here's Eingabe, but you can also search for Eingabe. Then you click it. Then it went to this string in the disassembly view. And you already noticed more screens are very useful. So if the string view pops up on another screen, this, is, this helps a lot. So here's Eingabe. Then I will click this thing and then look for references of this. All again, opened up on the other screen. There are two references. The first one is this one, and the other one is this one. The first one looks weird. This is probably just the thing I looked at. And the other one is used in some assembly instruction. Uh, so I will click that and go back to the source code. And here we are. Here is the stack cookie thing. Then it prints Eingabe on screen. First initializes a variable with zero, prints Eingabe on screen. Scanf is the function to read something. So we will just call this one, this variable, input. Um, then another variable is initialized with one. And then there is a loop that checks if this variable is smaller than input. And then something happens. And then this variable is increased by one. So this should be called i. And then there is another, the last variable. This is also the output, which we realized here at the very bottom. So I will just call it output. Normally, you can see when you type in this, we know that it pops up. Um, and maybe we already uh, see what this program does. It uh, takes an input, then squares the input, or then squares every number up to that input and sums them all up. So this is the sum of squares up to the number that was put in. Five minutes left. Thank you. Um, so this is just possible by clicking and double-clicking and receiving email. No. Um, 
So, and this software is in open source now. So every one of you can just download it. Also download OpenJDK to execute it. Execute it and start reversing stuff. Um, let me go back to the demo. And this, this is it, basically. Um, some shameless advertisement. Uh, I will be giving reverse engineering classes soon. So if you're interested in that, just hit me up. Give me your email address or, I don't know, contact me later and so on. And we now have four minutes or three minutes left for questions. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. First, a big thank you for this uh, introduction. I believe a lot of people are very happy. <laughs> there was one question. I believe there were more questions of us start here. Um, you explained what the different sections are for. Um, you didn't say what BSS was for. Can you explain that in four minutes, or is it black magic? It's, it's not magic at all. They are all well documented. Um, it's a bit out of scope to explain it now, but we, it's, you can also Google it. PE, BSS section will be a long explanation. You probably need some context to understand everything. More questions? There, at the very. Okay, you told us about <laughs> Ghidra, about this NSA. I think this is American, North American. What do you know about, about the reverse engineering capabilities of other countries? Maybe European, French, Britain, or even Sweden? But I'm interested also in the Far East and also Russian. What do you know about this? Uh, I don't know a lot. I, don't, I, I only think? know the software that is there um, and that is sold publicly. For example, IDA that I mentioned is just publicly sold. You can go to them and buy it. It's produced in Russia. This may be a motivation for the NSA to come up with an own software solution that they can produce in-house and maintain in-house and make sure there are no backdoors in the software you use for reverse engineering and so on. Uh, but I don't have insights into the secret programs of other nation states. Sorry. And if I had, I couldn't tell you, I guess. I don't know. No. <laughs> um, yeah, and I don't know. There, there are also not very, a lot of leaks for other countries. I, I haven't heard of any leaks from... Yeah. Next question, please. Uh, how does it compare to IDA? A Ghidra? Yeah. It's better and worse. So... I have to say, IDA has, um, is generally a bit better when compile, decompiling C or C++ code, also a tiny bit faster, which is very important, <laughs> because then you can use it more interactively. Ghidra supports much more, um, many more uh, ar architectures than IDA does. I think the IDA decompiler only works for x86. Ghidra can decompile everything it supports, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, but on the downside, the decompiled code is not that readable. For example, often memset or memcopy instructions are inlined by compilers. IDA always notices that, puts in, puts in the correct name. Uh, but if you use Ghidra, you sometimes start to uh, reverse memset, which is not good. Another question up there. Yep. Did you? Huh? Yeah, the but, but, but here's the microphone. He needs to talk. No. Um, did you compare it to another open source decompiler suite like Radare? Uh, oh, yeah. R R R Radare 2, or I don't know how to pronounce it, R Radar. Yeah. Um, it's, is it a decompiler? I thought it was just a disassembler. Uh, I compared it. Uh, it. As far as I know, uh, okay, Radare is much slower. It's, if you want to call it at, at scale, doesn't scale well. And I thought that Radare doesn't, um, doesn't produce decompiled code. It only produces disassembled code, does it? Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe or, or to, be, to be quick, I didn't compare them because I didn't know Radare could produce disassembled code, uh, um, um, could uh, decompile code. The next one. Radare has a decompiler since two years, and it's written in Rust, uh, Rade Doc. I think. Mm -hmm. um, second, uh, the hex race decompiler can uh, x86, uh, x86, x86, 64, and ARM 32, and uh, some ARM platforms. And okay. okay, 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 wait. And power, yes. Okay. It, 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 it can do much more. This and, is not uh, a question, this was a statement. Also, Eva needs to put the microphone away from you. And thank you very much for all your attention.